If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to the Gospel of Luke, looking at uh, chapter 23. If you do not have a Bible, please steal one under the seat, although it's not stealing because I told you you can have it. Um, But Luke chapter 23, and we are slowly approaching the conclusion of our study in Luke. Now, can anybody else hear that? Oh man, that's, (laughs) can I preach down here today? Does that sound good? Can all the short people like myself still see me? Uh, Cool? All right, God is good. Okay, so as we're in our portion of Luke, um, we find ourselves in an early morning for Jesus. And Jesus is going to be brought before Rome, where he's going to be examined and tried to see if he deserves the death penalty or not. And for Jesus, this has been a long night, because the night before, he was with his disciples, and he was praying, and he was betrayed, and he was arrested. He was brought into the court of the high priest, where all night, he's being questioned, he's being mocked, he's got to be tired. And in the early morning, uh, which was last week's text, he was brought before the high priest, or the high council of Israel, where he was, um, basically, they were trying to figure out the accusation that they would bring forth to Rome against Jesus. So they're trying to get Jesus to confess, to show that he's guilty and deserves a death penalty. And so this morning, now, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, bring Jesus before the Roman authorities. And let's see what goes down. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 1. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse Jesus, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar, and he claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I found no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had wanted to see Jesus. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there uh, accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, They had been enemies. Funny how Jesus brings even enemies together, huh? Well, let's talk about the text. So, when Rome would conquer a region, Rome would put a governor over that region. Sometimes the governor would be called a prefect, like Pilate was. Sometimes a governor might even be given the title king. And in Jerusalem, or excuse me, in Israel, there's two main regions. There's the north part and the southern part. And the southern part is Judea. And the governor of Judea is Pilate. And in the north, we have a man named Herod. And he is in charge of that area. Now, these governors are accountable. And they're appointed by Rome. And their jobs... I would like to say are fairly simple, but I'm sure it's difficult. But they have kind of three primary jobs. Number one, the governors are supposed to make sure that the taxes are collected to keep the coffers of Rome nice and full. The second thing that they must do, and this would help ensure that taxes came in, is that they were the peacekeepers. They acted as the judges, and they had to keep the order in the community. And thirdly, also related to the second, is that it was their job to prevent an uprising. So the people began to act out and look like they're going to turn on Rome. The governor's job is to make sure that that doesn't happen. 
In our text here, we're about 30 AD or so. And in the last 30 to even 40 years, there have been a number of uprisings in Israel. And these uprisings are usually led by a leader, and these leaders are called messiahs. And so the governors of Rome are used to putting messiahs on crosses. Why? To put down rebellions. So, Jesus is brought before Pilate. Now, if you were Pilate, what is going through your mind when Jesus is brought to you? Would you view Jesus as a legitimate threat? Probably not. You see, Pilate is no dummy. He knows the Jews. He knows that they are sick of Roman rule. He knows that they are waiting for a Messiah to come. He knows that they look to their scriptures that prophesy a Messiah will come. And so when the Jews get around a Messiah, it becomes a dangerous thing for the peace under the rule of Rome. So is Jesus a threat? <laughs> Apparently for Pilate, he doesn't think Jesus is a threat at all. And I think basic logic would tell Pilate this, right? If Jesus was really a threat that everybody was getting around, then why would the very leaders of Israel bring him to Pilate? See, Pilate knows that is really not the real issue going on. And actually, you'll see this in the book of John in chapter 18. You can check it out later if you want. Uh, John records more of this scene that we don't see here in Luke. But when Jesus is brought to Pilate, Pilate first hears their accusations that he's the king. And Pilate's like, seriously? He's like, you take him and judge him by your own laws. But the people say, wait a second. No, no, no. Pilate, we need you because this man deserves death and we have no right to invoke the death penalty. So the Jews keep pushing. And Pilate pulls Jesus away from the Jews and he says, so, you're a king? You're a messiah? Well, in our Lucan text, um, Jesus simply responds, you have said so. If you look in John's account in 18, Jesus not only says you have said so, but he also, he also says instead, he says, you know what, yeah, basically I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world anyways, because if this is where my kingdom was, people would have fought for my arrest, and they would have kept me from being arrested. And Pilate just kind of is like, okay, <laughs> okay, so you're crazy. And Pilate sees no threat in Jesus. So Pilate turns back to the crowd who have come, who are throwing out accusations and who are mocking Jesus. He says, hey, here's your king. I find no basis for a charge against this man. Well, the people, they don't like it. So they keep pressing Pilate. He says, but Pilate, you don't understand. Jesus, wherever he goes, he's causing, he's causing people to, to, to like go against Rome and he's causing problems and he's stirring people up. You don't understand. He started in Galilee and he's coming all the way to Jerusalem. And Pilate says, wait, did you say Galilee? Is he a Galilean? Well, if he's a Galilean, let's have him see Herod because Herod's the governor of Galilee. Herod happened to be in town and so uh, Jesus is sent over to Herod. Now Herod, Herod is excited for the opportunity because Jesus spent most of his time in Galilee. Jesus has a reputation. He's healing people. He's performing miracles. And Herod's like, hey, this is great. Finally, I can see Jesus. He wants to be entertained. He wants a piece of the story that's been going around. But what happens? Herod is completely let down. Jesus performs no signs, no wonders. In fact, as Jesus stands before Herod, he doesn't even say a word. He simply stands there. <laughs> Herod's like, seriously? You're what all this fuss is about? You're this great messiah, this great miracle worker? And Herod decides, you know what? 
let's have a little fun with this. Why? Because Herod likes to mock the Jews, also likes to mock Jesus. And so he said, okay, if you're a king, well, let's dress you like a king. So Herod takes one of his royal robes and he has it put on Jesus. And then in that moment, Herod, along with his officials, began to make fun of Jesus. And it's not just making fun of Jesus. They're also making fun of the Jews. The Jews, powerless at this point, hoping for Messiah. Herod comes along, hey, here's your Messiah. Some joke he is, making fun of the Jews. And he sends Jesus back to Pilate and says, you deal with him. Well, Pilate, when Jesus shows up in his robe, he's delighted. Why? Because Pilate also loves making fun of the Jews. Actually, not only does Pilate like to make fun of the Jews, historically, um, Pilate loved to antagonize the Jews. And the Jews actually hated Pilate. On, on two occasions, um, during the nighttime, Pilate had literally false gods or images of the emperor for worship. He had them put one time in the, in the temple, in the Jewish temple, another time in another holy place in Israel, um, just to upset the Jews, because that's the kind of guy he was. This one time, later on, he actually took money from the temple treasury, and he used that money to build an aqueduct. And of course, the Jews are like, you can't take this money. And so they have this, this meeting with Pilate and the Jews who've come to protest. But in the crowd of protesters, Pilate has all these soldiers who are undercover. And then after the people bring forth their request and their petition to not build the aqueduct, Pilate gives the signal. And all of a sudden, these soldiers take off whatever they're wearing and they slay hundreds of Jews and hurt a significant number of them. This is the kind of guy that Pilate was. See, Pilate was a constant reminder that the Jews desperately needed a Messiah. And now that there's a Messiah, he's being brought to Pilate. There's a great um, piece of irony there. Well, Pilate, because of his love for antagonizing the Jews, I mean, he's so excited to see Jesus in the robe. He thinks it's hilarious. He thinks it's fun. And he thought, man, maybe this Herod is not such a bad guy after all. We don't know why they were enemies. There's no sources that will tell us, but whatever it was, mocking the Jews and mocking Jesus seemed to bring them together. (sighs) Yet even as the Roman officials, Pilate and Herod, simply dismissed Jesus as just another crazy guy, and as the Jews themselves dismissed Jesus as the Messiah, there's something incredibly powerful going on that they can't even see. If you remember from last week when uh, Robert was preaching, did a great job. Um, One of the things that Jesus said when they asked him if he was the Messiah, he said this, at the end of chapter 22, Jesus said, listen, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of God Almighty. What's Jesus saying here? Well, Son of Man is one of those titles that he loves to use of himself. And it's not a title he made up. It's a title that he borrowed from the Old Testament, specifically from a book called Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, Uh, There's a particular text that means, that actually meant a ton to the Jews at the time because it was their hope. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. It's what Jesus is looking back at. Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What's Jesus saying when he quotes this? He's saying, guess what? Right before your eyes, this very scene is happening. The Messiah is being led into the presence of God Almighty. Well, he will receive all power and all glory and all authority. And even though it looked, that the, looked like the path of Jesus where he was going to the cross was one of shame, was one of defeat, it was actually the path towards glory. 
And later on, after Jesus dies, and after he raises from the dead, he has a conversation with his disciples. He tells them, he says, listen, guys, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He says to them, basically, you know what? Guess what? I'm the one who sits on the throne now. Do you remember a couple weeks ago when they put that robe on me? Yeah, that's nothing. You should see the throne that I have in heaven. And we get pictures in Revelation, right? This throne that basically looks like it's on a rainbow. That's beyond human words. And around the throne that Jesus sits on, there's all these beings with multiple eyes. And they're just crying out and they're proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Jesus is saying, listen, everything under heaven and earth is all under my word. If I tell the mountains to move, guess what? They're going to move. Whatever I say is going to happen. Nothing under the sun or perhaps nothing in all of creation is free from my rule. Jesus says, I am the king. Now, as we sit here together, I don't know where you stand when you think about this, but I, for one, am extremely grateful that Jesus is the one in charge. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. Because he's the kind of king that we desperately need. He is forever strong and steadfast. Nothing will ever get in his way and prevent him from doing what he wants to do. He supplies absolutely everything we need. He gives strength to the weak, hope for the hopeless. He carries us when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He needs, he knows all of our needs all at the same time, and he meets all of our needs according to his perfect timing. That is amazing. He is a God, a king, who is merciful and compassionate. His reign is righteous and just. And even when things don't make sense in this world, when it seems that the bad guys win and the innocent are suffering, when life doesn't make sense, we can count on the fact that he is in the process of sorting all things out, and we don't have to worry about a thing. He is not only the great shepherd, he's also the gate by which we enter into full life. And how did he do it? Why? Because he gave his life on a cross so that each of us could be forgiven and free. And even when I find myself selfish and greedy, which I'm probably not speaking for just me, even when I treat the people around me poorly, guess what? His forgiveness is always available to me. And whenever I turn to him, he can restore me, he will restore me, and he will raise me up. Why? Because he's the God of second chances. Sometimes, though, he does discipline me, because we all need that from time to time, but he's making us into the men and into the women and into the children that he wants us to be. He calls us to live a radical life of grace and love and forgiveness. But you know what? He's the king who's never asked any of us to do what he himself was not willing to do for us. He understands everything I'm going through, so I never have to be alone. And every time I wake up early, when we wake up early in the morning and we say, this is the day the Lord has made, I think that he smiles. Every time we're driving in the car and we pause and we reflect and we look around and we say, God, wow, look at the mountains. Look at what you have made. Thank you. I think that he smiles because whenever we say thank you, we, we recognize that every good, every perfect gift that we have comes because he chose to give it to us. He's a good king, isn't he? But it's not just about what he does for me or what he does for you. It's simply about who he is. He's not a temporary king who is going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Rather, he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. He's been around since eternity before. I mean, we can't even make sense of that. And he'll be here forever. He calls himself the King of Kings and he calls himself the Lord of Lords. He is completely faithful in every way. And as Robert told us last week, every knee is going to bow before the throne of Jesus Christ. It's not a question of 
if you're going to bow or we're going to bow. It's a question of when we're going to bow. For those of us who choose to bow a knee in this life, we experience the wonderful benefits of living in his kingdom, don't we? But as many who would choose to bow in this life, there are many who would choose not to bow in this life. See, when we choose not to bow in this life, you know what we're like? We're like children pretending and playing a game. My kids love to pretend to be, you know, either like ninjas and all this type of fun stuff. And they'll pretend for a while, maybe they'll be superheroes or maybe the girls will be princesses. But ultimately, all the pretending has to stop sometime, doesn't it? Because there is real life. Not bowing our knees, kind of like living in a dream. It's not really real. But God has something so much more for us. You know, it's interesting. We look at the Jews. And they so desperately wanted a Messiah. Their lives were so messed up. They're like, we need to be freed. But the problem was, is that when the Messiah showed up, when he actually began to take control, when Jesus showed up and tossed the, you know, the tables in the temple, and he said, what you're doing here is not good. All of a sudden, the Jewish leaders didn't want Jesus because bowing down to Jesus meant that their lives were going to be messed with. And a lot of people, sadly enough, decide they don't want Jesus because they don't want everything that comes with Jesus. Because, yes, he gives us great gifts, but at the same time, we have to give him permission to mess with our lives. There was Herod, too. What did Herod want from Jesus? Herod just wanted some miracles and some signs. You know, he just wanted to be entertained for a little bit. Jesus wants way, way more than that. One of the sad dynamics of the story, as I look at it, you have the Jews, and they are the people of God. In the Old Testament, God told the Jews, he said, listen, of all the people in all of creation, you guys are my treasured possession. And through you, I'm going to show the whole world what I'm like. Because your temple and your worship is going to be a safe haven for the world. And you're going to draw multitudes to myself. But the Jews were not faithful. And when the Messiah came who was going to be there to raise them up, they didn't want what he had to offer. And so there you have the Jews who have become simply a laughing stock to Rome. I meet a lot of people out there, and sometimes they, it's just excuses, and so we take it at that. But a lot of people have turned their back on the church and turned their back on God because of the hypocrites and the judgment they feel from the church. Sometimes that's very warranted. Sometimes it's not. But when we choose to profess Jesus, but we don't bow our knee to him, guess what? We come off to the world. Judgmental hypocrites, a laughing stock. They view us as a people who have no power. But the reality is, as we looked at in the book of Ephesians in Sunday school class, we are a people of power. And not, not power in a, in a worldly type of way, but God has given us the same power that was used to raise Jesus from the dead. The book of Ephesians tells us that, that power has been given to us as the church, which is absolutely amazing. Our testimony as we bow our knees is meant to make a huge difference in this world. Jesus didn't come simply to say, although he did say, I'm preparing a place for you. He said that, which is awesome. But he also said, and by the way, my kingdom is coming with me. The kingdom is near you. And his idea was that his disciples lived as disciples in this world, that the kingdom of God would start to invade this broken world. That's why Jesus shows up and, sa and says, hey, you know what? My life is good news to the needy because the poor are going to be fed. The prisoners are going to be set free. The gospel is a beautiful thing. So my friends, I know, I know so many of your lives if I, as I've got to see them. And man, I, I always tell people that I love being the pastor of this church 
because of what I see in the people here. I often see acts where the knees come to the floor and people just submit and say, I'm going to serve God and love well. And I would simply say to you as a church, keep doing that. Keep bowing your knees to the Lord. Look for areas in your life where you've chosen not to bow and figure out what that means for you um, as you bow your knee before the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with that, shall we pray? Jesus, we thank you that you are king. Thank you that you are the exact kind of king that we need. You are gracious and loving, and you're mighty and powerful. We can count on you in any situation. Lord, this morning, I know in my life there's some areas that I could probably do a better job submitting to you and letting you to be Lord of those areas. Help me to do that. Help us all to do that. And God, as we submit to you as king, as we go from here this morning and live life in this world, may we live as you are king. Help us not to pretend. And Lord, as we live for you, may you use your power in us for your sake, for your kingdom in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand up and uh, sing with us as we prepare to go this morning?